But right now, it is my pleasure to uh, bring up to the stage uh, Christina Dunton, who is a policy fellow in the Purdue Policy Research Institute uh, here at Purdue. Christina. Oh, very tall. Um, good morning, everybody. My name is Christina Dantum. Uh, thank you for joining us today. Uh, I'm the lead undergraduate policy fellow at the Purdue Policy Research Institute um, under Dr. Claussen. Um, and I actually graduated on Sunday. Um, and thank you. <laughs> Thank you. I, um, I got my BS in behavioral neuroscience and a BA in political science, and I'll be pursuing a master's in public health, specializing in health policy in the fall. Um, and I am going to introduce our moderator for the panelists, Miss um, Sharon Weinberger. She is the Washington, D.C. Bureau Chief for Yahoo News. Uh, she previously was an executive editor at the Foreign Policy Magazine, and before that, the National Security Editor at The Intercept. She has held fellowships at the Radcliffe Institute for Advanced Study at Harvard University, the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars, MIT's Knight Science Journalist Program, and many more. She has a very impressive resume um, and has written on military science and technology for a multitude of magazines. Um, so it is my pleasure to introduce her. Please welcome her. Hi, thanks for joining us here today. I think the best way to do this is to have each of you just introduce yourself, and then I'm gonna start with a question, and all of you, I believe, have a couple minutes remarks to make. Hey, I'm Joe Peckby, I'm a professor of chemical engineering. Uh, I'm also co-founder of Advanced Process Combinatorics. I do research in algorithm engineering and manufacturing. Uh, and I'm Bob Ladiff, I'm a retired Air Force general. Uh, spent a lot of my time in the space business. And I'm Don Howard. I'm a professor of philosophy at the University of Notre Dame and a fellow and former director of Notre Dame's Riley Center for Science, Technology, and Values that Bob serves as a, a director or chair of our advisory board. I'm Jennifer Erickson. I'm an associate professor of political science and international studies at Boston College. I study the laws and norms of war and weapons politics and arms control. Good morning, I'm Tim Schultz. I'm the Associate Dean of Academics at the U.S. Naval War College in Newport, Rhode Island, and I am a historian of science and technology. Great, so I just wanna start off with a very general question that I don't expect you each to answer in detail, but as just sort of a way to think about the issues we're facing. Um, I still remember in October 2001 with the first successful drone strike, it introduced this very vigorous debate about push-button warfare, about killing from a distance. And you know, this is now almost 18 years later, and we're having a very different conversation with the advent of algorithms and artificial intelligence. As these debates have evolved, how has it affected your different disciplines? What are the ideas um, in morals and ethics, the types of things you're having to debate now differently and think about differently than perhaps in the immediate years after 9-11? Um, and that's, start with you. Um. We have an expert on history of warfare. History, the history of warfare, as far as your question, is we've always been trying to push the distance between the person with the weapon and the, and the person on the receiving end of the weapon. I mean, bows and arrows, artillery, uh, airplanes. So the push button warfare that you talked about has a dimension where there's a human factors issue. Maybe somebody doesn't feel like they're in a battle and they can make a mistake. I think the difference in my mind with having an autonomous weapon is, is it's a qualitative difference from distance. You actually are taking a human being out of the loop. We understand the strengths and weaknesses of human beings. We've had millions of years to understand that. We've only had maybe 40 or 50 years with computers and only maybe two years with fast computers, the current ones. So I really worry about the qualitative change. So from those early days of the first drone strikes, uh, I think the whole business of uh, Autonomous weapons has is, is pretty well been discussed. There's a lot of literature out there. What, what concerns me more and sort of the evolution since those early days uh, is the autonomy that's being built into command and control systems, the general command and control systems writ large. Uh, and it's the topic that I'm probably 
think is more timely and one that I'm most interested in. So I'm interested in a lot of issues in this space, but two that I'll mention that I think have come into the foreground as especially deserving of our attention and our efforts. Uh, one is if we're going to go this autonomous route, whether to full autonomy or partial autonomy, one of the things we have to think about, and there are people in this room who have done a lot of hard thinking about this, is what would it mean to try to build some kind of ethical or moral competence into these autonomous or semi-autonomous uh, systems? So just thinking about what that means, what the toolkit you have to approach that, uh, that's an important set of uh, questions. Um, another set of questions that I spend a lot of time thinking about now uh, is with respect to new technologies of war fighting more generally, and especially with respect to uh, ever more autonomous weapons, is what's the impact of these technologies on the moral character of the individual war fighter and on the moral character of the groups and organizations within which the warfighter is operating, all the way from the level of the platoon up to, uh, up to DOD. And I hope that we can find ways to think more deliberately about uh, what virtue means in this kind of a technologized battle uh, space and how we cultivate uh, the moral virtues on the part of the war fighters and on the part of the institutions, as I mentioned. So those are two areas that I think have become of compelling importance. So I want to push back a little on this idea that all of these debates are so fully new. So I think we've seen new weapons technologies that come forward, um, and they're fascinating, they're overwhelming, but what I think is also equally fascinating is that a lot of the sort of political, legal, normative questions at some high level remain um, quite similar over time. Um, and so questions about what, is, what does it mean to be militarily effective? Why is it more humane to kill people in one way than another way? These are still sort of persistent questions. Um, and and these principles of international law and the laws of armed conflict that um, have, have been in conversation for, you know, a hundred years are still kind of the principles that um, civil society governments and others are drawing on when they're making arguments about these new weapons um, and often doing so in ways that are trying to kind of promote their interests. So I think it's important to kind of keep these big um, ideas in mind, um, that these big questions are, are long time persistent questions and what these new weapons are doing is perhaps drawing new dimensions to these questions. And so asking, you know, what does humane mean when we're talking about a, potentially a machine making the decision to kill rather than a human? Is that it's a different understanding of kind of how we've debated humane weapons in the past. So traditional arms control focuses more on the effects. Um, it's possible that some of the effects of these new weapons will fit very well within the ideas of, of more precise, more um, targeted warfare, um, and that the questions that are new are about decision-making accountability and what actually um, humanity means in that respect. So I think um, it's, it's important to keep both of those sides to the debate in mind. There's an old saying that says, you can tell civilization is advancing because in every war they kill you in a new way. And, but there's still these, these classic principles apply like just war theory and these use and bellow notions of virtue and what we deem as not just legal but as, as moral and correct and virtuous. Uh, that's not going away. I think with this notion of autonomy and where humans should be in the loop or on the loop is important but I try to remind my students that humans create the loop. They invent the loop. They, it's humans who write the algorithms. It's humans who direct the policy. It's humans who direct the funding and who do the training. And so these notions of, of virtue and, and principle embed much more than the actual physical act of war. They have to be woven in and considered far earlier. Let's actually start with that as a question. I mean, talking about that side, the idea of when people talk about moral and virtue, they seem to be thinking more about the outcome. How much thinking is that going into designing the algorithms? I mean, wh where is this debate actually taking place? I can't say how much thinking is going into the, into the design of the algorithms. I think technologists and scientists do what they do without a lot of thinking about it, the potential dual use applications and the and the bleed through, if you will, of their technology for for use uh, to promote violence. Um, so it's it's it, I think that's a, a difficult question to answer. It 
comes back to, and I'll probably talk about this a little bit later, is the role of, of education as we educate these scientists and engineers and military leaders and policymakers to sort of ingrain in them the expectation that they'll consider moral elements rather than doing something just for the sake of having it be done. Can I jump in there with a remark that uh, there's some uh, Ron Arkins in the audience here, and he'll be on panel three this afternoon. He's one of the pioneers in this space of thinking about how you literally uh, try to build the ethics into the functioning of these autonomous uh, these autonomous systems. So we might want to ask him that question uh, when we uh, reconvene later the uh, later this afternoon. Uh, but as I mentioned, this is something I've thought about a lot too, and I've been working on a project to ask uh, about the possibility of. Of, of, of thinking about these autonomous systems as moral learners uh, and using some of the techniques of modern machine learning theory to uh, see if there's a reasonable way in which we can grow these systems in moral uh, competence. Still just the germ of an idea, uh, but there's a growing community of people out there who are thinking about this problem. Jennifer, can you expand on your idea of humaneness and how that's debated? How is that being debated now? I mean, is that is the conversation about it changing, or where do you see it? So I think the traditional conversation about humaneness draws on these ideas of can you target the right people that you intend to target, not target civilians? Um, can you do so in a proportional kind of way? And so it's largely about the effects of the weapons. Um, if we're talking about today, weapons that are programmed in such a way that can do these things. Um, in some ways, the conversation for the, for the arms control community, and particularly the advocates in the arms control community, that distinction between advocacy and analysis was drawn earlier, um, that conversation is changing because now it's focused more on sort of the decision-making side and what does it mean to allow potentially a machine to make the decision to kill a human and is that inherently inhumane? Um, and that I think is a question we don't have an answer to um, and that needs to be debated and discussed by philosophers, ethicists, lawyers, pol political scientists, and, and the people developing the technology. And I don't think there is an answer to it, but they have, that, that campaign has really shaped the conversation around sort of um, the decision-making side and what that means. And so it is a change of conversation and a change of focus of the, the arms control conversation. But I don't think we know the answer. I think there's another dimension uh, that, that complements what was just said, and that is how can we use this autonomous technology to prevent war? Um, you know, we talk about humaneness of killing. The, probably the most humane thing to do is not kill by a human or, or autonomous. And, I'm, uh, and yeah, I recognize that we need a strong defense, but these technologies offer opportunities for peace and promoting the avoidance of war that we've never had before. And that is new, okay? I mean, the computers are just getting powerful enough that some things are becoming interesting. And so how can we use autonomy to prevent war? And that's the best. Um, I want to follow up on that because I think there's two sides to that debate again. It's, this is an ongoing debate, right? On the one hand, we can say, could this potentially lead us to have more opportunities for peace? On the other hand, the argument is made is if war is less costly um, to those who seek to make it. So if we're not putting soldiers on the front lines necessarily, we're sparing soldiers' lives, does that lower the threshold for war um, by making it less costly and therefore make the states that have those technologies more likely um, to want to use them? And maybe it's, it's military action that's short of a threshold of war and we can use other weapons to do that. But does that raise the just, possibility of more war? Just to be as provocative as possible, <laughs> since we're trying to provoke, um, I, I, I'm not just talking about having war be less costly, but avoiding it altogether. Yeah, so win, win hearts and minds. In other words, have, have uh, maybe bots that argue for democracy and, and capitalism or whatever. Do you, do you think that would work? <laughs> well, I'm provoking. I think it can work, yeah. I, I would like an example of that. <laughs> well... There are some people that believe that the election was influenced by computer technology, so it's possible to do it both ways, not just get one person elected, but, but to influence hearts and minds other ways in legitimate and moral and ethical ways, I believe. That's provocative. What's a, what's a, what, what, what's a, a, um, an ethical and moral way to use bots for good? Well, if all of a sudden people in a country who maybe are being oppressed understand that they're being oppressed and they have peaceful means to overcome it. We've got a country like that in South America. 
if there was some way that we could use our technology to help them overcome this situation. Uh, I, I don't know the means. I'm not that good a weapons designer. But, but, but it should, we should at least think about it. Otherwise, these thinking, this thinking goes along worn tracks, as, as others have pointed out. I'll give an example that comes to mind. Uh, you, know, you brought up the issue of the hack of the 2016 election. DARPA has stood up a big new program. The acronym is META4, I think, for Media Forensics, uh, where the, uh, the idea is to use advanced AI to identify deep fake, deep fake uh, audio, deep fake video, which some of us think is going to be the weapon of choice in uh, Russian attempts to hack the 2020 election. And so that's a very concrete way in which we can use some of this technology to at least mitigate or slow the uh, movement toward conflict. And so we can do that. We can out Russian that Russian technique by, by using positive bombing. Well. <laughs> and then we'll need an arms control treaty to control it. <laughs> Good luck to us. <laughs> Um, you alluded to command and control. I was just wondering if you could expand on that a little bit and some of the challenges we have with that. Uh, well, clearly, command and control is sort of a big topic. It's a, it, everything. It's everything from mission planning to course of action development to decision making, aids, and so on and so forth. Um, using AI, advanced AI systems, were talked about is a little scary there uh, because they are so subject to hacking and spoofing and adversarial pro programming and all kind of things. Uh, and, and the whole idea of automated decision making is one that, that sort of troubles me a lot. Uh, and that is, um, you know, back in the old days, I mean, I, I grew up in this. 70s, 1970s Army. Uh, back in the old days, you know, if you if you made a mistake, you had to sort of explain why you made a mistake. Uh, AI systems, automated command and control systems, uh, if they make a mistake, it's kind of hard to figure out why they did. Um, so it's just the whole idea for me of, of although we may never do it explicitly, you know, turn over decision making. The DOD says that, you know, decision humans will always be in the loop. I, I, I think as time goes on and warfare develops and evolves, it's going to happen anyway. Uh, and, and that's troubling to me. And probably the thing that troubles me the most about it is that the impact that activity will have on the individual human soldier what the individual soldier thinks of their role in warfare if decision making is taken out of their hands uh, maybe even not explicitly but if it's taken out of their hands you know what do they see as their role what do they see as their responsibility what is they what do they see as their accountability for mistakes under the laws of war and, and just war theory and so on and so forth. So that's a long rambling answer that, that basically says automated command and control and automated decision making is a really bad idea. Well, that's interesting. I mean, over the course of your career, have you seen that evolve? Because there have been elements of automation um, in terms of the feelings of personal responsibility or poor people's role. Has that evolved over the decades? Well, I, I think it has. Um, clearly, when I was coming through, there, there really was no automation to speak of. Um, I, I spent some time in the nuclear weapons business, and clearly those were all the decision-making. Automation stopped when it came time to actually do something with nuclear weapons. Um, spent a lot of time in the space business, and that's, a, that's another one that worries me a good bit because I'm seeing an awful lot of automated activity, uh, some really kind of scary things that are going on in space uh, dealing with uh, autonomy and, and uh, interactions between spacecraft that could cause us a problem. 
so yeah, I have seen it evolve, and it, it concerns me a lot. So I think I want to open the questions up to the audience. Um, I don't know if we have microphones or need them, but we can try with that. Sorry, did you have a question? So um, of being able to disperse your targets and having a dispersive effect again. So uh, that the artificial intelligence gives you an ability to have more pervasive situational awareness um, and that allows you to pick strategic, subtle targets. Um, so uh, the other thing that I'd also like to put out there is that nobody's really talking about the computational arms race that we're in. I can maybe say something about the computational arms race. Um, so Moore's Law is, is something that's out in the popular press. <clears throat> it's very well known. We're reaching a plateau in Moore's Law in terms of sequential computing. So they're lining out to a certain performance and then we're all parallelizing. We're using the cloud, thousands or millions of computers. However, computational capability for many of the things that affect autonomous vehicles or autonomous weapons is dwarfed by algorithm engineering. In other words, I might be able to get a factor of a million from using the cloud, but I might be able to get you know, 50 orders of magnitude by using a much better algorithm. So, so we're much more in an algorithm engineering race than we are in a computational race. Of course, computation is part of algorithms. Distributed computing does give you a lot of advantages, but algorithm engineering hands down dominates any computation. So, so we, the US has got to be the best in algorithms, in my opinion. Can. Fortunately, fortunately, algorithms are promoted by in intense innovation and creativity. So a society that tends to produce a lot of innovative and creative people is going to have an advantage. And, and, and I would say that a free society is best at doing that. So we have an inherent advantage. Why is a free society best at doing that? Well, when somebody tells you what to do all the time, it tends to squelch creativity and innovation. I tend not to be one that is innovative if he tells me what to do all the time. Yes, um, I have a question for the panel. I don't know if you're aware, uh, Jennifer probably is. Uh, there is a process underway in Geneva under the auspices of the Convention on Certain Conventional Weapons. It's a funny title, uh, but uh, so some countries led by Austria are calling for a negotiations for a protocol to the treaty to ban the deployment uh, of fully autonomous weapons because uh, ultimately the argument is that we cannot know and we cannot trust them in the ultimate uh, battlefield situation. Uh, Paul er earlier spoke of this. Um, so I, I wonder what the panelists think. Should we allow the process of development of these weapons to proceed, or should they be banned outright, or is there some other way to prevent uh, weapons from being deployed, which we, we, we can control? So let me take a shot at that. Um, first of all, I think an outright ban on autonomous lethal weapons is probably doomed from the start. Uh, banning something is, uh, who's, gonna, who's going to police the ban? Uh, and I have said and written uh, in many places that I think the better approach would be uh, one of having the arms control community, which was discussed a little bit earlier, um, actually try to take on the concept of non-proliferation of not just autonomous lethal weapons, but many of the AI uses in military systems. Uh, you're not going to stop it. The best I think you can hope for is to try to control and, and limit proliferation. Uh, having said all that, 
uh, uh, the U.S. Has, has not been doing a really good job lately of uh, arms control and treaties. I mean, we've been pulling out of treaties right and left. Uh, uh, but I think that that would probably be the better approach. I don't, I, I don't like the idea of an outright ban because people would just do it anyway and go underground with it. Um, I think that's a common argument about bans and regulations and, and, and um, with many weapons technologies. We shouldn't bother to ban it because um, somebody will always break it. And so I think we should be careful about making those kinds of arguments because in some cases they tend to create norms and expectations that at least for most states, most of the time, they're not going to violate it. And there will be somebody who violates it, but does that mean we shouldn't do it at all, I think is, is, is an interesting question. Um, I, my, my point of view on this particular question with the ban to kill, um, campaign to ban killer robots isn't that we should go and do it, I just kind of want to push back on this idea of the ban. Um, in general, we're talking about weapons here that there's, there's you know, a spectrum of things that have been realized a little bit to lots of hypothetical. Um, and in general, with weapons regulations and weapons bans, states are very reluctant um, to create bans on technologies that they haven't really had a chance to inspect and use and understand the cost benefits, military value, humaneness, and so on. And so historically, when we look at weapons bans, more often we'll get them after the fact, after they've been developed um, and used um, rather than kind of in advance. So I think it's unlikely that anything could happen now. I think doomed from the start is, um, I, don't, I, don't, I have friends in that community. I don't wanna tell them they're doomed from the start, but I, I think politically it's very, very unlikely. And at the same time, the more countries use weapons, they get integrated into military plans, they get um, industrial sort of interests around them, the harder it is to regulate them. And so there's a, a fine line to walk between when they're so new that you can't really talk about them in concrete ways and you're often hypothetical to they're integrated, they're part of militaries and militaries aren't going to want to give them up. And so those kinds of political conversations are often very fraught um, and, and you end up with compromises that might be broken um, and trying to find creative solutions to work with kind of what it has become a reality. Um, and so I think um, we should be it would be more useful to talk about these kinds of conversations about proliferation and, and what does this mean? There's a lot that's built into what the programming will look like um, and how those weapons are actually developed going forward that you know, maybe that ban killer robots campaign can affect that conversation going forward and make some of these better bots um, as a result of those conversations. So I don't think it's a doomed conversation even though I think that the, the sort of legal instruments that might come out of it will be the states that wouldn't have those technologies. So if I could just one quick yeah, follow up because I think you had. Uh, it, I'm, not gonna, I'm not saying that I, I trust either one of them necessarily, but uh, both China and Russia in recent weeks uh, have publicly come out in favor of sitting down and talking. Uh, I, I'll just leave it at that. I mean, there's some details that, that make it kind of fuzzy about what they want to talk about. Uh, but we have an opportunity now. We've got you know, our two adversaries uh, saying that they, they're a little bit worried about this AI arms race, maybe we ought to do something about it. It'd be a great opportunity, I think. There was a brief, shining, wonderful moment in the 1945, 46, 47, where there was a real move to ban and outlaw the further development of, of nuclear weapons, of atomic weapons. And that actually had a, a, a real chance for a short window of time before realpolitik and the security dilemma really, really dug in and, and we all know what happened. Uh, so even then, after the exhibit of the horrific uh, effects of atomic weapons, you couldn't get all sides to come together for a preemptive or a further ban on these type of weapons. So I think that a roughly similar logic would apply to lethal autonomous weapon systems because people haven't really seen the potential horrific use of them, and I think many sides uh, in the U.S. and elsewhere, they may see some sort of, if you will, a virtue in the use of them if they make war more precise and can reduce collateral damage. So I don't think there's a, a public or global appetite to really seriously consider a ban on this type of technology. Is there anything that you think would precipitate a ban or a discussion of a ban? I think it would have to be something public and horrific where 
uh, I, I, the example Paul Shari used earlier where it would have been legal to slaughter that seven-year-old girl who was out on patrol uh, as part of a Taliban element, uh, if a machine slaughtered uh, that girl uh, or similar innocence uh, and it goes viral, then maybe you can precipitate something. But even then, it it's, it's, would be difficult to do. Thank you. So I want to follow up a little bit on Paul's comments in his book. Uh, and one thing he talks about is that it's not just intelligence, but about freedom, right? And how much freedom we give the weapons. It's really under question. And we've had the technical capacity to use them for a while. But he talks about how actually there's been a very slow adoption uh, of especially offensive capabilities, of, of fully autonomous weapons. And the only example he can really think of is a harpy, right, in Israel. Uh, which makes me think that the question is not just about technical expertise and technology, but about, about politics, right? Why are we unwilling to, to, to have that freedom? Some of it might be jobs, some of it might, might be other concerns, some of it might, might be this, the fact that we're not sure what the answers are. So can you talk more about this politics of freedom question, right? Not just about do we have the capacity for making smart and smarter AI, but why are we so unwilling to use it? <laughs> It's a very complicated question. Um, there, I mean, one answer could be that if you use and it doesn't work very well, then you, you tip your hand that it doesn't work very well. I mean, so you don't want to use a weapon and, and not be effective. Uh, you, you give your advantage away. But there's lots of other reasons. Um, I don't think, I, mean, I, I do work on algorithms every day. I've been doing it for 30 years. I, I don't think the algorithms are as capable as people think, OK? I mean, they, they, when you work on them every day, you think, Man, that algorithm's really stupid. Okay, it doesn't. It's not. It, I call this an artificial, you know, an artificial intelligence system. But boy, it's not very intelligent. Okay, um, so so there's a lot of reasons why you might not want to use these weapons. I think number one, they're not as effective as, as the popular press would have you believe. People have been watching Commander Data from the '90s, and, and it, they're not that. They're not that effective. If I could make a comment here too, there's also a lot of pushback from within the uniform military over the. Uh, expanded use of different kinds of autonomy. And you see many manifestations of this. So Paul in his talk uh, put up the slide of that uh, a U.S. Navy uh, autonomous uh, drone that for the first time ever made a landing on a carrier. And a lot of people at, the, at first thought that was going to be a real breakthrough technology that would rapidly transform uh, naval aviation. Uh, but the story as I hear it, uh, and I'm not on the inside, but the story as I hear it, is that there was just a lot of pushback from the fast pilots in the, uh, in the Navy who saw their role uh, seriously under threat. And that that's one of the reasons why the Navy leadership dialed back on this, uh, this program. But Bob, you're in a better position to comment on that. Well, I, I can comment on that. I'm not sure I can comment on a questioner's specific question. Uh, but that was really what I was talking about earlier, is uh, there's a change in roles that comes along with the use of autonomous systems. Uh, and, you know, at the end of the day, warfare is about I'm sorry, it's about people killing people, right? And AI systems, AI-controlled weapons, whatever they are, are, are just nothing more than tools. And my concern, again, not answering the question, is my concern is that we go from, from the human soldier, sailor, airman, marine, using AI as tools to the automated systems using the individual soldier as nothing more than a way to make their decision happen. That's it's kind of a role reversal thing that's uh, more concerning to me. Your, your point. Where's that line? I mean, actually, can you expand on that a little bit? Where does it go from the one to the other of, of the soldier using the computer and the computer being sort of using the soldier? I, I don't know. I mean, I can. I was thinking of a scenario in which, you know, and Paul will rec will resonate with this. You know, wherein you have a infantry platoon with sort of a grizzled old sergeant who's been in combat for several years, several times, and a young lieutenant who's been playing Pokemon, you know, for 
you know, and, and the computer, the satellites, the drones, the intelligence systems, the AI says, this is the best course of action. And the sergeant says, you know, I've been here before, I've done this, I don't think that's the best course of action. But we go with the computer instead. That's, that's where you've basically done a role reversal. And you've let the, the tools take over. And, and that worries me. I think that's a real concern, actually. Can I follow up briefly on that? In that same scenario, imagine if the lieutenant is told by this computer analysis, take this route to avoid the enemy. And, and the, the grizzled old sergeant says, no, I, I think we should go you know, route B instead. But, he, but the lieutenant says, okay, we're gonna go the route that the computer is telling me to go. And he goes that route and his troops get shot up. It's a mistake. Who's at fault? Who's going to be blamed for that? I would think it would probably be the commander, the lieutenant. Uh, now, if he did go the, uh, follow the route of the computer and and things worked out well, is he going to get the credit? And so there's there's this odd dynamic going on now between what this algorithm is telling you to do and where the liability and responsibility still is, and it, and it becomes a leadership contest, I think. And you can apply that into many different scenarios, aviation scenarios, et cetera. So there was a, a comment that was made about traveling well-worn roads previously, and I think that uh, my question is more about pulling up a couple notches and thinking about the role of AI in terms of uh, national power, you know, the dime model, diplomacy, information, military, and economic. So I would ask the panel to think about what would we be able to do to discern if, for example, we had an adversary that was using advanced AI, AI say, 15 years from now to manipulate all those elements of national power, both within their construct and across the international space, to, to achieve their objectives, perhaps without even firing a shot, you know, from a military perspective, without using robots on the battlefield, but, but manipulating our economies or our information process or even our own society, as we've seen in some cases. So uh, just your thoughts on are there tripwires we can start looking for now that the intelligence community should really be looking out for? I have a very simple answer to that question. Uh, probably controversial, but um, kind of goes back to our, the manipulation of the 2016 election. Um, if that were to happen to us 15 years from now, whose fault would it be? It would be our fault. Uh, Tim, uh, this... <laughs> Do I have... So, uh, Tim, this question is for you, but really for the entire panel. You're all educators in one form, form or another. You alluded to education before. Could you comment on, you know, what do we need to do as educators, what are public university here, uh, to train the leaders of the future, the, the civilian and military leaders, to wrestle with these issues? Sure, I, I think, of course, there are legal and moral and ethical implications, but there are also implications for education. Something that I'll just, I'll answer your question by use of an example. Uh, what we're doing at the, the U.S. Naval War College, two years ago we established this new program called the Graduate Certificate in Ethics and Emerging Military Technology. And it's a volunteer program for room for about 10 to 12 students. We typically have about 20, 25 applicants. And we have them focus their studies in coursework involving uh, technological change and ethics, and we, we force them to have a mix. They take a course called Science, Technology, and Strategy, and another course called Ethics of Technology, and they can take a course called Plato and Aristotle for Warriors and Foundation of Moral Obligation, and we expose them to major ideas about how to, th how to think ethically. What are different ethical lenses? Most of them are utilitarianism, utilitarians, because they just see that, well, if it's for the greater good, it's ethical. But we also get them to think about uh, duty ethics, these ideas of Immanuel Kant and, and uh, the notion of virtue ethics put forth by Aristotle. Sometimes it doesn't matter what the outcome is. Sometimes it matters if it's a, if it's a, a good or an evil act inherently. And we try to get them to apply that to current and emerging technologies. And we have them 
uh, under the guise of a faculty mentor, write an extensive research paper on the topic of their choice, and they come up with some really interesting ideas and some concepts. One of one student last year came up with this notion of, uh, in regarding autonomous weapon systems, well, what do we do about acts of code? And what he meant by that was a comparison between acts of code and acts of God. An act of God is something that nobody is held liable for. Well, what about an act of code where you can't hold somebody liable because you can't trace the origins of that mistake that resulted in some unjust outcome? And we have students writing about, uh, should we uh, enhance humans? A current student is saying, if and when human enhancement occurs, it'll probably occur in the Special Operations Forces community, and it'll involve different types of cognitive and physical enhancements. How should that be governed? What are the, the rules and regulations and expectations of, of physicians and technologists and commanders who should oversee that? And should they be only temporary enhancements that don't persist uh, after that soldier uh, retires? Things of that nature. So we're trying to do a grassroots thing where we get students to think differently, not just in terms of operational effects, which a lot of our students will naturally default to, but to think about broader implications and this notion of virtue and is this the right thing to do? And it's hard to get them to think that way and we get a lot of help from outside experts. Uh, Peter Singer sitting right over there, he uh, uh, engages uh, several times throughout the year with our unmanned systems elective and gets students to wrestle with important ideas and we're also trying to engage with other outside experts. So it's just a small little pocket, uh, it's, a, it's a beta test where maybe it'll influence the broader curriculum, but we're trying to establish the expectation that in the modern age, you need to think differently. You need to think classically about these notions of virtue and not just uh, what serves the greater good because in sometimes, in many cases, that may not be an act of virtue. Could I jump into the question? I'm sorry, did you want to speak? So, um, uh, all of the major academies, uh, West Point, Air Force Academy, uh, Annapolis, have been building capacity in this uh, area for a considerable period of time now. I just uh, had a meeting a couple of weeks ago with Commander Joe Bonin from the Coast Guard Academy, which is now standing up a program on AI, uh, society, ethics, and so forth. And they're deeply committed to making ethics and policy a part of that uh, program. But Dimash, you, you are asking the question from the point of view of a big public university, uh, which has a different, uh, a different private, mission. Private. Uh, or private, yeah. Uh, uh, yeah, we have different missions from the, from the academies, but we all train leaders, right? And uh, I think we have to uh, make an even greater effort to think about what the, the contents of our curricula and what we can offer our students to help them tackle these uh, challenges. So at Notre Dame, over the past 10 years, we've invested very heavily in a wide, rapidly expanding array of courses in technology ethics in general, uh, starting with this fantastically successful course on the ethics of emerging weapons technologies that Bob helped us design 10 years ago, and he helps us teach uh, every, uh, every year. Uh, we offer 60 seats in that class, and we could easily put 120 students into that class. And it's the same for all of the courses that we offer in this tech ethics uh, uh, space. There is an inexhaustible appetite out there among the current generation of students uh, for opportunities to think more carefully and rigorously about this. And I think any smart dean uh, should be, uh, you know, uh, working really hard to uh, bring on board the faculty, grow the competence that is needed, and expand the uh, curriculum in this area. And n nothing but good will come from that. Just a 30 second add to that, because I don't want to get back to you. A, a direct answer to your question is that I think universities would do well to try to find ways to teach their student body about the military somehow, uh, whether it's through these courses, but find a way to in make people understand more about the military. So I wanted to start with an anecdote from my own class. So I teach at a, a private university. I, last semester I taught a 
seminar with undergraduates, mostly seniors, on globalization and national security. And we had one class on private military companies. We spent two hours where they were just like freaking out about private military companies. They were saying, these are terrible things. We should get rid of them. They're amoral. Force should not be in the hands of, of, of private companies. It should be held by the state. So we're sort of the end of class. I said, well, what do you think about lethal autonomous weapon systems? And they sort of said, what's that? I said, oh, killer robots. They said, oh, OK. Um, and they, they said immediately, vehemently, without thinking, they said, that's terrible. That's worse. I would much rather have private military companies than a government-owned, <laughs> operated, programmed lethal autonomous weapon system. And they had this sort of immediate reaction where they hadn't thought about it. It was just sort of viscerally kind of how they considered the topic. And I think we can see this in public opinion experiments that political scientists have done. If you just ask people, they'll be very immediately opposed. If you put it in a broader context, they might say, you know, that protects the military, for example, they might be more in favor of it. And so I think this speaks to our need as educators to think more broadly about um, interdisciplinary training where we have students with technical expertise that can understand this, but also in the context of ethics and politics um, and law. And, and at, at our universities, I think we can do that. I think we're well positioned to do that in teaching students in general to think critically and to take apart the problem rather than sort of just have that gut reaction to it is really an important part of what our jobs are today. I'm going to answer that question in a more narrow way, and maybe Tomas would guess my answer, but I think we have a special opportunity, maybe even obligation, to educate military officers in advanced degrees, PhDs, masters. The Air Force recently announced, I don't know whether it's being implemented or considered to be implemented, it was in the paper, that they're going to manage the PhD officers in the Air Force just as they manage generals in terms of their assignments. They're going to Not be very well. Well, <laughs> so there's an opportunity. There's an opportunity. So, so I, I think. Yeah, to use a historical analogy, the special forces were supposed to be the PhDs that could win a bar fight. I'd like to see most of our officers get uh, advanced degrees. I think we'll have a, a, a military that's, that's more able to deal with all these issues. Actually, I have a quick follow-up. As the students start to dissect those issues, do they change their mind or do they still decide that a private military contractor is better than the killer robot owned by the government? I think this is at the crux of some of the debates today. Um, and for them, my class, they uniformly decided that a human should get to decide to kill a human in a very direct way, and that machines could never be moral, and therefore they shouldn't have that kind of capacity. And so it was their understanding of sort of where, what is morality to them um, that led them to, to have that um, that conclusion, but I could imagine um, a different group, you know, my students um, are at a Catholic university, they spend a lot of time talking about morality and ethics and virtue, um, and that's sort of where they came to that. Um, but I would be curious, I think you could have a broader conversation about what do we mean by moral, um, and that it could come out in, in a quite different way if it means, you know, I think the, the, the counter argument I kept trying to get them to sort of take apart a little bit more was that, you know, if, if this means that fewer troops are going to be put in harm's way, um, wouldn't you prefer that? And they, they, they really felt like there was something inherently wrong um, with the machine sort of being able to have some, some autonomy in, in deciding killing and that, that, in, that in itself, you couldn't get past that for them. So I don't know how that might develop in the future. But. I think, thank you. I think we're about out of time. Um, thank you to our panelists for the discussion. Thank you. Oh.